So, you know, we see during World War II, the women played a very important role as intelligence officers in turning German intelligence spies to work for the Allies and then having them feed information back to the Germans that was completely false, then sent torpedoes and U-boats completely the opposite direction of Allied troops. An excerpt from today's guest who's written about the pioneering female spies who built the CIA and changed the future of espionage. New York Times bestselling author Nathalia Holt is here, and I'll speak with her right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of Despair. We've launched a new Point of the Spear Originals video series on our YouTube channel, and the first episode, Lincoln's Last Hours, is streaming now. Few Americans alive today are unaware that our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated while in office. It has been a part of American history textbooks for generations. But unanswered questions and little-known facts about his final hours remain, which are both revealing and disturbing. And it has been contended by forensic anthropologists that the president was actually dying months before the fatal shot, which ended his life. Click the link in this episode's description to check it out. Welcome back. And before we get into the show, remember to click that follow button on the podcast. It helps more military history lovers find our program. And thank you. Today's guest is the New York Times bestselling author of Rise of the Rocket Girls, the Queens of Animation, and Cured. She has written for numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, The Atlantic, Slate, Popular Science, PBS, and Time. Her book is called Wise Gals, The Spies Who Built the CIA and Changed the Future of Espionage. And author Nathalia Holt joins us now. Nathalia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's an honor, and I tell it. I say that to everybody, and it's always true. And uh, I'm glad you could make it. This is, uh, I haven't read the full book yet, but it looks incredible. And I wanted to know what your research process was for the book. Well, this was a long research process. You know, I think most books take many years to track down documents and to find people to interview. Um, But for me, this book was even longer because I had to file Freedom of Information Act to the CIA Mm -hmm. in order to declassify documents as well as find the CIA officers, both retired and current, who had worked with this group of women. And in addition to that, I visited a number of different archives. I was able to get documents from all over the world from that. And I also found the women's families. And that was important to me because I wanted to be able to talk about their personal lives as well Mm. as their professional careers. And these are women whose families Uh, did not know what they did. They had no idea that they were a part of these operations or that they worked for the CIA. And so it was interesting to learn more about what those relationships were like with their children and with their parents and and with their friends. And in this process, which must have been several years, did you uncover anything that you debated using in the book? Well, it was difficult because I had so much material covering decades. You know, these are women that served during World War II and then served all the way up into the late 1970s. And -hmm. so they were a part of so many different operations that, quite honestly, my first draft of this book was way too long. I just was trying to include every single mission that these women had been part of. Um, And it was difficult to whittle that down, as you can imagine, Um, But I really focused on the operations they were part of that protected national security and prevented war. And many of those operations are ones that haven't been written about before. That's that's surprising. Were there any um, things that still remain classified in your research? Everything I wrote about is declassified. Um, These are all, of course, events that took place many decades ago. So I'm not revealing any information that is classified. Um, But there's so much detail in these stories, um, particularly some of these operations, such as Operation Lincoln, that Eloise Page was a part of, where she was bringing scientists into the Soviet Union on vacation. So basically, the CIA was sending these scientists on vacation, but closely matched to their peers in the Soviet Union. Hmm. And this operation is occurring at the same time as our many failures in Cuba, 
But by contrast, the Lincoln operation is an amazing success. And Eloise Page is able to obtain intelligence from inside laboratories all over the Soviet Union and gains detailed plans on Soviet weaponry and biological weapons um, to an extent that really ends up being important in preventing war in the decade ahead. Would you say, and that was one of my questions, that there was a standout mission, or maybe this is the one, that had the most impact? You know, it's hard to say because there are just so many different missions. So, you know, we see during World War II, the women were very played a very important role as intelligence officers in turning German intelligence spies to work for the Allies. And they were successful in tracking down these spies, leaning on them, getting them to work for the U.S., and then having them feed information back to the Germans that was completely false, but then mm-hmm. then sent torpedoes and U-boats completely the opposite direction of Allied troops. Um, so these were some critical missions that happened during World War II. And then during the Cold War, uh, there's, there's quite a few, but one that really strikes out to me is the story of Elizabeth Sudmeyer. So she was mm-hmm. raised on a reservation in South Dakota. And then she served in World War II, went to junior officer training as part of the CIA, and then was sent to Syria and Iraq. And in Iraq, she is able to create these spy networks that really no man could have done at the time because Mm -hmm. she creates them from hair salons and a tailor shop. And she's Mm -hmm. able to recruit men and women into her spy network and then gain secret plans on Soviet fighter jets as well as other weaponry. Um, But where her bravery really shows is in 1958 during the Iraq Revolution when Americans are being targeted and killed in the country. And immediately every CIA officer flees Iraq. They immediately leave, Mm -hmm. except for Liz. She stays behind. She's the lone CIA officer remaining in the country. And she does this to protect their spy networks and to send intelligence about what is happening back to Washington. And this is a really critical point in history because President Eisenhower is being told by his advisors that he should send troops into the Middle East. And in fact, some troops do arrive as part of Operation Blue Bat. But it is thanks to Elizabeth's work that war is ultimately prevented. Do you also think that she was too deeply embedded to leave that it would cause that perhaps she thought it would cause discovery of the of the spy network? It absolutely would have. And of course, Mm -hmm. many of the men that she worked alongside did leave. Uh, Many of them had families or even those that didn't have families ended up leaving, although they knew it would crush their spy networks. So the fact that Elizabeth stayed is is kind of amazing because she really was risking her life to do so. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next time, U.S. Marine and author Bill B. will be here to talk about his brush with death and harrowing journey in the war on terror. Yeah, I, uh, I saw a curtain move probably about 100 yards away at a building that was adjacent to ours and kind of drew down on that, expecting that's where the shot was coming from. And in reality, it was about 90 degrees offset from a completely different direction. And as soon as I drew down on that guy, the whole world basically went dark. Another program you won't want to miss. And before we get back to the conversation, if you're enjoying the story of these pioneering women, Be sure to check out our earlier show, The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, with author Major General Mary Kay Eater. There are heroes, there are role models, there are people who came before me. And the style of writing that I used for this is to make it more accessible, I think, to a younger generation. It's episode 105 from season one, and you'll easily find it in our past programs. There were trailblazers, obviously, Did they run into any friction from the male colleagues, any jealousy, anything like that? They did. You know, this is the 1950s. And so to have women that are rising in the workplace in a a male-dominated field, of course, you can imagine friction occurred. It's not surprising. Um, But what is surprising is what the women did in reaction. So in Mm. 1953, Alan Dulles was appointed as the new director of the CIA And during his swearing-in ceremony, a group of the wise gals gathered, and when Dulles casually asked the crowd, do you have any questions, 
they immediately began to pepper him with questions and asked him, what are you going to do about women at the CIA? How are you going to prevent professional discrimination against women? And what happened wow. from this very crazy moment, so you can imagine, I mean, even in a modern workplace to have women questioning a new agency director on the day of his swearing in is a, a very bold gesture. But in 1953, it was just unheard of. Women did not do this. Um, but the women knew they were trailblazers. And from this moment, they end up forming what is mockingly called the petticoat panel by male colleagues. Um, but what ends up being a gathering of women who assess the role of female officers at the CIA. And so they go through all the statistics, they create all the charts to show that while women are doing the same amount of work and the same type of work in developing and handling spies at the CIA, they're not being paid and promoted at the same rate as their male colleagues. And of course, this is not surprising at all for us to hear today yeah. that this happened yeah. in the 1950s. But at the time, this was really a bold measure. And it ends up being critical in making the CIA what it is today, an agency that is half women and has Avril Haines, the first female director of intelligence at its helm. They are 50% women today? That's right. Yes. Oh, that's surprising. And it is surprising. But, you know, even in 1953, the CIA was ahead of its time then. It was 39% women in 1953, whereas in other federal agencies, it was about a quarter women. So it's, it is impressive to see how the CIA has actually always been a bit ahead in hiring women. It's good to hear. Getting back to the research process and, and the release of the book, did the CIA actually get a look at this book? I know you said that uh, everything has been declassified, but the, did you have to send a copy to the CIA for review? I did not have to send a copy to the CIA, um, but I did. And the reason I did is because I wanted the historians at the CIA to review the book and mm -hmm. find errors that I, you know, for any book, when you're writing uh, anything this long, there's going to be mistakes that are made. And I was fortunate enough to have a historian at the CIA really review and go through the work with me. And this was really helpful because I feel like even though I do point out very low moments in the CIA's history. I also point out some real highlights that haven't been shown before. And of course, the women that I write about are all women that loved the CIA. They loved their work. They believed in what they were doing. They, they really felt like they were promoting national security and they really cared about their country. And so to make sure that this book was as accurate to that vision as possible was important to me. Um, and so I tried to make it as balanced as possible by having a number of different experts review the book. Now, to close, is there one woman that stood out to you or you connected with that you'd like to tell our audience about? Well, I don't play favorites, of course, <laughs> um, but sure. I would like to talk about Jane Burrell. And she is a woman who joined during World War II. She was an intelligence officer and in an elite group known as X2. And she really had an extraordinary career. However, in 1948, she was traveling from Brussels to Paris when her plane went down. Mm. And she, along with 16 other people, died in that flight. She was working on an operation at that time. And so this makes her the first CIA officer to die in service to her country. However, she has still not been given a star on the CIA's memorial wall. And so it's my hope that by sharing her story, we can right this injustice and, and get her the recognition she deserves. Absolutely. And that's very surprising to me that uh, that hasn't been corrected yet. It's time to go on a crusade, I would say. <laughs> yes, her story is so inspiring. It's amazing what she was able to do during World War II. She went on these amazing treasure hunts, uncovered millions of dollars worth of gold hiding in the Italian Alps. She turned many German spies. She really risked her life on many occasions. Um, and so it's, it's important that we recognize her as the American hero she is. The book is called Wise Gals. And Nathalia, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. Next time, U.S. Marine and author Bill B. will be here to talk about his brush with death and harrowing journey in the war on terror. Yeah, I, uh, 
I saw a curtain move probably about 100 yards away at a building that was adjacent to ours and kind of drew down on that, expecting that's where the shot was coming from. And in reality, it was about 90 degrees offset from a completely different direction. And as soon as I drew down on that guy, the whole world basically went dark. Another program you won't want to miss. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or click the follow button. And be sure to check out our Point of the Spear YouTube channel with bonus video material plus full military history documentaries. There's tons to explore, and I hope you check it out. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from Audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.